gets you out of that mindset? I have to say my little ones um, <laughs> because they're watching. Mm. So you know, I have to be mindful of the fact that they're watching. They need to see mommy, you know, get it together and get out the door. Um, so that's that's my motivation on those days where, you know, it's a little bit difficult to get going or I feel like, oh, I don't feel like doing this today, which which I have to say with the training piece of my of what I do, mm -hmm. it's rare that I say, you know, I don't I, I don't feel like doing this today because I have such a ball when I get there and I get in the classroom. I have so much fun. If there's a cause you strongly believe in, what would it be? I'd say, you know, education and educating the at-risk at risk youth, at-risk population, I think that's so key. I think that in, in, in working in that field, what I found was students, and I'm going to say that students were thrown away. So students were basically told that, that you can't do it, you won't do it, you won't succeed. So working in that field was so important. And I encourage anyone who's looking and thinking about going into education to think about that population because they were wonderful. And yes, we had our challenging days and <laughs> yes, we had our tough moments, but the reality was that that was the most rewarding experience to be able to pour into those lives and see the fruit of our labor. You mentioned uh, opening a book uh, and reading as a form of improving oneself. You've written a book yourself. I wanna I wanna take you somewhere hypothetical. If if you had to go to a favorite place to relax and take your favorite book, your favorite drink, your favorite music, where would this place be? What would you be reading? What music will you be listening to? Oh my <laughs> So it, this isn't too hard, actually. Um, and what would you be drinking? I forgot that one. Okay, so I would... <laughs> you're going to laugh at all of my answers. So I would be on the beach by myself. By yourself? Yes, by mm -hmm. myself on the beach, um, drinking Welch's white grape juice. <laughs> it's my favorite. <laughs> um, what would I be reading? Well, you know, you, you're going to think that I'm just saying this, but... I want to read your book and I started My reading book. it. Yes. I started reading it today and I want Thank to you. read that. Um, as you know, as I'm going through, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a copy before I leave today, Thank but, you. um, but something inspiration, something motivational. I don't want to read. I wouldn't be reading anything that, that would be, um, too hard to swallow or to digest. So it would have to be something that were motivational, uplifting. Um, a book of Nikki Giovanni poems might be it. Um, so it would be something, something uplifting and inspirational. And what would I be listening to? I would be listening to <laughs> um, Jill Scott. Jill Scott? Yes. Oh, one of my favorites too. When are you most happy? When I'm doing what I love. What are you most thankful for? My family. Oh. What advice would you give to young people considering going into business for themselves? I would strongly encourage them to do their homework. Kind of, and absolutely, mm -hmm. yes, do your homework, research, whatever it is you're looking to uh, go into business for. And how do you do your homework? Uh, it's not just about reading, but it, which is important, but it's not just about reading. It's getting in touch with people who are doing what you're interested in doing and having a conversation, asking them to maybe mentor you or even sponsor you, depending on who that person might be. And then I would encourage them to, I'm going back to what I said before about self-assessment. Mm -hmm. I would encourage them to assess what are the things that, are, that they're good at that would, in, that would um, enable them to be successful in that particular endeavor. So taking a look at the strengths and what strengths they could bring to that, but also looking at what lies in the gap. So this is where I am. This is where I'd like to be. What do I need? Is it additional education? Is it more experience? What is it that I'm missing? So that I, would en I would encourage them to do those two things. Figure out what's missing by self-assessing, but also talk to someone who's doing what it is they're interested in doing. If you could go back in time, what would you tell your 15-year-old self? <laughs> Why are these questions funny to me? Um, my 15-year-old self, um, I would say, see, you know what's interesting? That whole take advantage of opportunity piece, uh -huh. which we talked about 
we talked about before, um, that's been what I've used to encourage other young people taking advantage. So I would say, you know, just be open. I would tell myself, be open, be, be open to the possibilities uh, because there's so many opportunities out there. There's so many possibilities and you don't want to limit yourself. Last question. Okay. What makes you laugh out loud? Uh, I'm funny, so I, I'm just thinking, <laughs> sometimes I make myself laugh, but um, <laughs> um, I think, you know, I was talking about my husband before, and we just we just spend so much time just laughing, so sometimes I'll just be driving along, and I'll think about something funny that's happened at home, and I will start laughing, I will, um, so I think it's those things, I think it's those personal moments, those, um, you know, the inside jokes, those are the things that make me laugh out loud. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kimberly, for sharing your time with us and sharing us so many pearls of wisdom. And I hope I was able to twist this gem a little bit <laughs> and expose the various facets of Kimberly Ferguson. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to reading your book. I'm looking forward to your next visit to CWS. Perhaps CWS as it is on Sunday afternoon where you can speak on something specific. Nice. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Good night. And this is Selwyn Collins saying... Thanks for listening. Good night. Fear not what fear whispers to you. Fear your obedience to it. And be creative. We're yeah, back to the lovely Lauren. Lauren, mm -hmm. what are most people surprised to learn about you when they get to know you? Oh, wow. <laughs> what are most people? You have to ask them. I don't know. Um, uh, oh, okay. Let me phrase it this way then. Okay. What is one thing about you you believe that might surprise people to know that? know about me. That didn't make it easier. Oh. Um, <laughs> you know what's funny? I think uh, uh -huh. what's something that people learn about me that surprises them? Oh, you think might surprise them? Sometimes I'm really funny. <laughs> 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 Sometimes I'm really funny. I'm like a quirky kind of funny though. I'm just kind of like out of nowhere kind of funny. Um. <laughs> How do you define beauty? Oh wow. Beauty, you know, beauty for me is always from the inside out, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so it's, it's really more about who you are, how you how you treat other people, you know, and that's what makes you beautiful. What do you would you say you've learned about yourself um, over the lifespan of your through the lifespan of your career? Hmm. Um, I only have patience for certain things. Like I'm a very patient, kind and patient person, you know. I was raised well, uh, <laughs> but you know, sometimes I, I don't have, uh, I was saying something earlier, I'm a very realistic person, okay. you know, so I don't have space for insincerity, you know, um, and then I've, something else recently, not recently, but I've, I let go of what other people think of me or how they see me or worrying about other other people think of me, you know? So this idea of being shamed for something you did or didn't do, you know, kind of thing. Like, yeah. life is too short, you know? Like, we all have stuff to work on. <laughs> you mentioned your grandmother, mm -hmm. you know, what an impact she had your mom, um, you mentioned the ancestors. Mm -hmm. When things are not 
when right, right to you, when, when the challenges are overwhelming. Who are you listening to? Who, who, who are you channeling during those times? Wow. The things aren't going right. Yes. You know? Who's in your head? Who's, who's Definitely my family. My family, you know. I hear my mom saying, "Are you happy?" Because she asks me all the time, "Are you happy?" Are you happy, Laura? I am. I am. <laughs> I am. Um, it's very important. It's it's, it's been a, a guiding light, you know, because it it makes me listen to my spirit when I ask that question, you know. And then my dad, my my dad is very. Um, you know, he would say things like, well, we've taught you everything you need to know. Go, Go ahead. ahead. You, we've Tell taught you me. everything you need to know. Sounds good. <laughs> when, 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 when are you most happy? When I'm dancing. Yeah. It could be anything. It could be in a dance class. It could be a performance. It could be just playing around in the living room. It's, yeah. When I'm dancing. What are you most thankful for? Wow, so much. I'm thankful for Only one more. Only one? Yes. yes. Okay. okay, give us two then. <laughs> ah, what I was thankful for. Love and life. Oh, yes. Love and life. Where do you draw your inspiration? Wow. You can have to curl her up. Yeah. But that's. I'm not going to say of your life, but you can have to curl her up to special dance. Where would you go to for inspiration? Charles, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know. He's going to be like, uh -huh. oh. <laughs> I mean, he, he, it's funny because, you know, he's known me half my life, mm. you know, um, maybe even more than half. But, um, and so, yeah, like he, he knows, he knows so much about me, and, and I, I know so much about myself because of him and relationships with other people. You know, it's just probably Charles. <laughs>
uterine fibroids? Is that a fair question? That's a fair question, especially for me, because that's one of my main work that I do. Mm -hmm. um, because uterine fibroids affect a lot of women, especially black women. Okay? Um, we don't know the exact reason, but maybe it has to do with diet, mm -hmm. food. You know, a lot of the foods are kind of laced with hormonal stuff. Mm -hmm. And the hormones tend to trigger the growth of fibroids. But officially, the answer to that is we don't know why fibroids come about. But um, when they do come about, the management of fibroids often has to do with the woman's, um, I wouldn't say age, it's the woman's desire for childbearing, the way you manage those fibroids. Because a lot of people just do a hysterectomy right away for fibroids. But I, I was trained a little differently to be conservative and try to save the uterus. And so I do what's called a myomectomy instead of a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. And the myomectomy means you're removing the myomas. Each fibroid, you have a medical name for it, is myoma. So I do myomectomy. And you do a myomectomy in a very conservative way so that you can um, preserve the woman's uterus for the possibility of childbearing. Mm -hmm. Some women just do not even want to have another child, but the fact still remains, if you're going to do a myomectomy, you have to do it well, so that the woman's uterus, the integrity of the woman's uterus is kind of intact. Mm -hmm. So whether or not she wants to have a child, she has an intact uterus that's put together nicely and sits in her abdomen really well and not cause her pain and discomfort along the way. Talking about child childbearing, uh, how are abortions on a woman's body? Abortions, you know, there are different types of abortions. Mm -hmm. You have the abortions, uh, but in the medical world, we call miscarriages. We, the medical word for it is abortion, I meaning you have aborted. Yes. But the regular world think of abortion as something you wish on yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. So. An abortion, or what we call a spontaneous, I mean a, a, a voluntary abortion, voluntary termination of pregnancy, um, can take many forms because you can have an abortion very early, six weeks, four weeks, once you find out you're pregnant. And a lot of times those abortions have very little impact on the body. But I hasten to correct that by saying, depends on who does these abortions. Because if it's not, it's not in the hands of somebody who really know what they're doing, then they can cause havoc on the woman's uterus. When you go in that cavity of the uterus to take out that fetus, mm -hmm. you, could, you could create scarring. So if you're having an abortion, you should go to somebody who really is proficient at it. And then you have abortions at different levels of, of pregnancy. You have the abortion where you can just go in and Use what they call a curette, and you remove or suction the poop. Should we go on? You know, you sorry. Should we go on? I yes. Don't know if get turned up. No, I mean. You know, you can suction out the, the fetus, mm -hmm. or you can, if it's older, then you can have a procedure with a patient. Um, you sort of initiate a, a spontaneous abortion where the woman expels the fetus. Do, do you have any advice for women who are pregnant? Well, in general, pregnancy can go from one week to nine months. So in that whole sphere of pregnancy, the most important thing is to take good care of yourself. Because mm -hmm. for the time being, you are the home where this fetus is going to live. So if you have a pregnant, if you have a baby inside you and you're smoking and you're drinking, and you're cursing and swearing and you have bad thoughts, then all those things affect the fetus. If you have negativity, stress, worry a lot, it affects your baby. Everything affects the baby. You know, you mentioned negativity and, and energy and thoughts. Absolutely. And, and I, am, I am drawn to that other aspect of your, um, of your profession, uh, acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine. Who in your family, if any, was involved in health care? And was your mother or grandmother a healer? 
my my grandmother's father, from what I understand, was a doctor. He used to deliver babies, but I, I never did get to explore it because I found out so late. But um, I, I know the medical, um, there are a few people in my family who are medical people. There are some younger people in Jamaica and I have found out from my father's side, or physicians, and um, from my mother's side. And um, people, you know, I'm a formerly trained doctor, mm -hmm. but when you look way back, people are always trying to heal. So I grew up with a grandmother who was always picking the bush and rubbing it on and healing. So that's that can be in the blood too. I want to ask you a question because I want to um, create a sort of bridge between your practice of Western medicine and Eastern medicine. Okay. But I would like to I'd like to give you the opportunity to introduce us to your upbringing and what you might have been exposed to while being raised in the Caribbean and Jamaica uh, specifically. Tell us some things that you might have witnessed, might have observed, might have been exposed to that led you to believe that there are alternatives. Yes, you know, you're from the Caribbean, I'm from the Caribbean. You know, we, we, know, we all know alternatives. We all know that there are people in our family that would cure us from certain things without taking us to the doctor. You know, we know that. Yes. And so, as I said, when you're a child, you kind of, you don't even know how much you're absorbing. But I do recall, as a young girl, mm -hmm. when I was in high school, that I used to be fascinated with the other aspect of medicine. Because a lot of medicine, Western medicine, come from, still, to this day, come from herbs. A lot of the chemotherapies yes. come from herbs, come from plants. A lot. You know, because the drug companies make it sound so fancy. Mm -hmm. But tamoxifen, which is one of our modern chemotherapy drugs, is, is a herb of medicine. You know, vincristin, vinblastin, these are big time, very expensive chemotherapy, come from periwinkle. You know, penicillin came from, you know, mushroom. You know, it's, 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 it's very old stuff. Mm -hmm. So, but as a child, I remember I used to try to sneak into the University of the West Indies with my friend. <laughs> we used to go in and she did literature, my friend Barbara, which she could be listening, and she was also always into her literature. And then I would go to the university with her when she used to go and study Shakespeare and those things, and I would sneak down to the science library, and then I would borrow these books. They, maybe they thought I was a student. <laughs> I would borrow these books, and, uh, and I would take them home and study plants. And, oh, I can't believe this plant can do that, and I was very fascinated with that. But these are things I kept to myself, you know. My mother knew my, that I was always borrowing these books, and she'd take the people's book back, what do you do with this book, you know. But I was very thrilled by the fact that plants can do so much. Mm -hmm. So one thing kind of led to another, where I started to study and look into Chinese herbs, and then, you know, I was fascinated with ginseng, white ginseng, and all these things, and then I came across a company that does Chinese medicine, and so I joined up with them many years now. I've been working with um, this company, and we do a lot of herbs, Chinese, mm -hmm. pure, authentic Chinese herbs, and, um, and then, I guess, getting involved in that level of Chinese medicine, I was fascinated by acupuncture. Um, acupuncture is another very long story. You wouldn't have time for this show. But I can't <laughs> well, you'll be coming back, so I that's fine. I happened up on acupuncture, uh -huh. and you know, one thing to another, I went to China and got to see a little more of what they do, and I was just amazed. It was just the most amazing thing to see. Stroke patients just walking out, you know, it was something to see. Because I am sold. So since then, I've been doing acupuncture, okay. which is like over 20 years. Over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Let me just go to the chat room for a second. G asks, are you pro a proponent of the HPV vaccine? If so, why? Well, 
Well, that's a very, very, very good question. I have not really advocated for it, mm -hmm. um, only because I'm not too sure about it. I, I won't say too much, but I have not really advocated for it. Um, the HPV is a very dangerous virus, so it's something where if if, the, if it's explained to the person and they want to take the vaccination, then there's a some amount of wisdom in doing that okay. as a prevention if you're really sexually active. And um, Kali, Kali said, Dr. Martin, thank you for being on the program. What types of ailments would acupuncture be better suited as a therapy? Well, in this side of the world, the Western world, they think of acupuncture as something for pain, and it's wonderful for pain. But when you really study acupuncture, for example, I was in China, central China, and we worked in a clinic near the University of Chengdu, and they literally treat almost everything. High blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes. And here, I, I do some acupuncture for other things. When I do acupuncture, I don't just treat pain. So the standard thing that most people know is the joint pains, the headaches, the migraine. Acupuncture is just remarkable for that. Mm -hmm. But there are certain other diseases that acupuncture works very well for. And um, Kali asked, which cultures do you admire for how they practice medicine? Wow. <laughs> very interesting. I have an interesting audience here. Yes, that's very interesting. Yes. Um, well, I'm a little biased, but I, I admire the Chinese. Well, obviously, I'm trained here, so yes. I admire Western medicine. It, it, when practiced well, it is really fascinating and interesting and can be very deep in terms of the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Some, of, some aspects of it, however, are abused. But what I admire about the Chinese is how they believe that the body can really cure itself. I find that in Western medicine, I have to say we, because I'm a Western doctor, we jump a lot to take things out and fix things. I mean, for emergencies, you can understand. But the body doesn't get a chance to sometimes heal itself. A lot of heavy drugs are given to people. And these drugs cause side effects. And the drug companies, they wait and then they tell you, oh, this is called a side effect, but that might, that's like years after the drug mm -hmm. is out there. People are not told when the drug comes out that this could cause this or this could cause that. So unfortunately, people experience the side effects and then there's a recall or whatever. So I admire the fact that the Chinese, and the Chinese embrace a lot of Western medicine, mind you, because when I was there, across the street as a Western hospital. So they really embrace Western medicine. Mm -hmm. But they believe in combining them. And the Chinese people, they embrace it. And it was very interesting to watch them leave from the Western side hospital to come over to us on the Chinese side to, um, to get another opinion. On it. But how did you become involved with weaving traditional Chinese medicine um, into or natural traditional Chinese medicine into Western medicine. How did I? How did you get involved into weaving the two? Oh, okay, combining the two. Mm -hmm. Well, because it makes so much sense, you know. Mm -hmm. When I went into medicine, and every doctor I hope went to medicine to make people feel better. So it's very simple. Um, one medicine alone sometimes doesn't do the trick. And so, for example, if I have a patient coming to me and she has, she's suffering from, let's say, endometriosis, which I don't know if you know that disease, very painful disease, and you're going to admit the patient to the hospital to do laparoscopy or abdominal surgery in another day or two, I do acupuncture on the woman and she gets to go home, relax, you know, talk to her family, pack her bag and come to the hospital the next two days. Whereas when the patient is doubling over in pain, you have to send her to the hospital in an ambulance. So I get to quiet the pain 
and then I still do my Western thing. Hmm. G asked, how do you use Chinese herbs in your practice? Is there a herb that is useful for, say, HPV? Well, I work with a, with a company I work with, um, and the herbs they have, uh, they're traditional Chinese medicine, but they're packaged, kind of Western looking, they're in caplet forms and mm -hmm. cap seed forms. And there are uh, numerous herbs, you know, we have all the different ginsengs, we have the different tonics, we have the herbs that work for the joints, we have the herbs that work for diabetes, and we, we have teas that clean the blood and clean the system. And so it's very, uh, it's packaged really nicely and patients get to go home and open them. It's not all of that they dealing with Western medicine, but it's not. And I give them the instructions and they all, it's been many years of that and they all wow. seem happy. We have multivitamins and a lot of people don't nourish their bodies well. So, mm -hmm. you know, a very wonderful multivitamins that um, addresses different aspects of the body's needs, you know, like minerals and stuff that are missing. That we don't get from our regular food. How do you deal with patients who doubt the effectiveness of acupuncture? Well, how do I deal with them in terms of how I approach? I don't argue about acupuncture. Acupuncture is 5,000 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't argue. If anybody doesn't believe, I don't know. I would know where to start. I would try to educate them. But you don't argue with something that's 5,000 years old and still, and still going on. I want to ask you this question and take a quick break. Yes, sir. What are some common fears and myths about acupuncture? Well, the, the fears that people obviously have with the needles. I'm being stuck by a needle. But if it's any constellation, it's not like the needle that's used to draw blood. It's a very tiny, in fact, we refer to it as filamentous. That means it's like a little filament of a needle. And um, because it's so tiny, when the needle is going in, most people really don't feel it. You know, they feel a sensation because there's a sensation which we call the chi. Mm -hmm. And that sensation is really almost like a reassurance for the, the doctor doing it that, yes, I'm in the right spot. That's really what that means to the doctor. Even the patient might say, ouch, you know. Oh. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun <laughs> for me. And patients get a lot of good results and they seem to love it. So. Let's take a quick break. Yes, sir.